No. Uh, yeah. Hello, can you hear? Okay, at least get used to that mic thing. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to our talk. I think there was just a talk about like the um, overview of the security landscape in, uh, in the CNCF, and now we want to continue that to give a bit of an overview of the um, observability landscape. Um, before we dive in, just a, a quick introduction to ourselves. Um, you want to start? No, should I? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll start then. Normally we do ladies first, but I, I, we're going to change that today. So I'm, I'm, I'm Ms. Matthias. Um, I'm f uh, from Germany, not too far away. In Stuttgart, it's like the next closest city, so like only four hours by train. Very happy to be here. This is my first rejects. And um, I have to cut this short because we only have like about 30 minutes to do this. Um, and I give it back to you. And yesterday you said it was three hours. I don't believe you anymore. <laughs> anyway, yeah, uh, I'm Tiffany. Uh, if you want to know a bunch more stuff about me and a bunch of talks I'm doing, you can just go to my website, tiffanyfay.dev, and then that's my Twitter and LinkedIn. So, yeah. Okay, so this is a 30-minute talk. If you feel like afterwards you still want to listen to us for like three hours, um, here's a deep dive that we did at DevOx, so you can take a look at that. Okay, so question is, all right, so one, why are you here? And uh, why do you care about observability? So hopefully the need for ne observability is pretty clear. Um, if you've worked with Kubernetes before, which I assume most people attending this have, you probably found it pretty complex in the beginning and they're trying to understand everything that is going on there. Um, so basically in this talk, we're going to go and like show different tools and things that can help make your life easier. So like why it, can it be such a problem when we have Kubernetes and a bunch of other things. So basically there's just like a certain level of complexity that we have. So over to the right, you can see that we have a bunch of different containers that you have. Um, these could be various like polyglot different languages. You could have different frameworks and being able to know more about just like what's specifically happening there, but not just between like with the individual applications, but also what's happening between the different applications. Then there is also all of the Kubernetes API objects that you need to at least have some understanding of and that you have to worry about too. Um, then we also have our, so we have the app level and then we also have the infrastructure. So there's the control plane and then depending on how you're running that, what you may be able to uh, see there. And then you have your worker nodes, which is where your applications are running. So like in short, basically there's a lot of things there that you need to be able to like know about or try to figure out what's going wrong. So that makes observing Kubernetes kind of complicated. So basically there are a bunch of different places where you can have introspection. So basically it depends on like what level of metrics that you might want. Like so for instance we might have our application, you can do specific things there. Uh, your application is then running in a container which runs in a pod and that runs on a node. So at every single one of these points you could be able to do some introspection. There's also, you have your API server and then also your infrastructure as well. And it's basically like a trade off of like, what do you specifically need? So maybe there's things that you have to deal with, with like overhead and configuration costs and just kind of figuring out balancing what you need versus what you have to give to do that. So basically there are a bunch of tools out there that help that you don't have to necessarily go and build all of this yourself, which is really great. However, this is a slightly outdated screenshot. Apparently it now scrolls the other way, but basically trying to figure out everything that is happening here, there's a lot. Um, we are not going to obviously go into all of this. I don't even know how many days or weeks or months this would take. Um, but basically if we take a look a little deeper, we can see that there's stuff that's specifically there for like monitoring, logging, tracing, et cetera, that help in the space of observability. And so we're going to touch upon a few of those based on things that are either like that we have used in the CNCF landscape, basically, and open source in general. All right, thank you. So the way we're going to do this, um, we start with like the, the simplest form of basically coming from the outside and going further in on the cluster. So I'm going to start talking a little bit about Kubernetes API-based tooling, um, which is like the highest level form of, of introspecting things happening into your cluster. Then, as Tiffany showed, there are various levels, um, how you can get like closer to what's happening inside. We're going to go on big to pod based and node based monitoring and in the end finally uh, close things up with the application based stuff. So um, yeah, the API, the API based uh, components that is actually when you would place your agent connecting to the Kubernetes API and try to query the information from there 
and, and see how, f how far it, um, it can give you um, in terms of help. Now, when people get started with Kubernetes, probably the first thing they're going to interact with is the Kubernetes, the kubectl API. And you already have some high-level information with commands like get, describe, and logs, where you can find out what is the individual state of your components. Um, do you see certain events which are not looking right? Um, and, and get a higher level feeling of what is going right or wrong. There's also things like debug and exec, where you can actually start interacting with the components and, and query things deeper. Now, also on that level, you have a certain form of tools. Um, they kind of normally separate into three categories. You have the CLI-based ones, you have like web-based ones, and you also have some kind of fat clients. Also, in addition to what Tiffany already pointed out, um, what brings the complexity into observing Kubernetes is not only the various kind of different components that you can look into, it's also kind of the, the changing landscape of tooling that you have. I've been talking about this topic for a while, and when I did my very first uh, talk about that, uh, I, I, I was pointing out to tools like um, VMware Octane, WeFork Scope, Lens, and so on. And over time, I realized things are changing here. So open source projects get abandoned or not, uh, not continued. Um, things turn commercial. Um, fun. And then we pointed out there's canines, which is, has always been a good open source friend, uh, stayed with us, and we're certainly going to highlight this one. But new things come in, so the landscape is changing. People from Headlamp and Schooner would probably object and say they're not new kids anymore, uh, which, is about, <laughs> which is about right. But still, as opposed to the others, they are, they are on that landscape. They, they still do the thing. And I just want to give an, an, an overview uh, of what's happening here. Now, as said, 30 minutes won't be enough to live demo all that. If you are interested in any of those things, please feel free to see us later. I have an environment running where I can show individual pieces of those components. But for now, screenshots will have to do. So this is uh, canines. Most of you have probably seen this. Um, it's just like, a, uh, like an aggregated form, all command line based, which is very often helpful if you don't have like a, a window environment. So if you only have a shell, this will always come in handy. You can also list and sort your resources, have a quick observation if things are going right or wrong, and can drill down into the details um, from there. Now this is old octant and lens, so um, we're going to go over these. In, in general, if you know one of those tools and what they can do, you kind of know what they all can do. They don't like extend the functionality of what your Kubernetes cluster can do anyways. It's just like they give some nice navigation, um, especially when people start learning Kubernetes. This can be very helpful when they get flooded with all the new API objects and what do they all mean. So you get like sorting, aggregation, um, nice visualization, you can figure out if things are, like, are failing, restarting, um, are, are exhausted, and so on, and can go in, in there deeper. One of the things um, that I wanted to point out here quickly is that debug functionality, it's, it's not super new anymore, it's like I think it came in with API version 123, um, but it's still very helpful if you're like, in troubleshooting or diagnosing. What it actually does, um, it attaches another, like the binaries of a container um, to the running container in your pod. So it's not like a sidecar which runs things in a, different, in, a, in a different process, but you load all the binaries and can execute it from there. So this can be very helpful if you have like a distro-less container or something like, or if, you have, if you're missing some diagnosis tools in your container environment, then you can simply load it into. I mean, it is as dangerous as it sounds, so you should not enable this by default. Um, but when you're in such a situation that you have like a, a failing application and you still want to query some things while it is still alive, this can certainly be um, a big help there. So to wrap things up on the, uh, on, as I say, on the entry level side, so the API tools do not need to any change uh, in, the, in the cluster or application. So you can just use them as they are, um, query the stuff that your API allows you, API allows you anyway. So it's completely non-intrusive. It's also very helpful for getting started with Kubernetes or getting a quick overview. But with that, of course, it also has limitations. So um, even though the tools might show all your pods healthy and running, it still might be the case that they're not talking to each other and things are not working well or you have some ghosts and so on. Um, and you wouldn't be able to find it out just with that. So to, to get there, you probably have to go a level deeper. 
Before we go a level deeper, uh, I just wanted to have one quick word about Prometheus and Grafana, because this slide was actually initially not in there, but people just told us we, we cannot speak about observability without mentioning Prometheus and Grafana, which is about right. Um, anyone in here not familiar with Prometheus and Grafana? Okay. <laughs> I would have thought so. So we can go over this. I mean, we later on, Prometheus and Grafana, of course, not like standalone observability solutions, but it's like you have the, 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 the data store and you have the customization dashboard that you can use. And we will later on have references um, of tools exploiting uh, the functionality of Prometheus and Grafana, but we're not going to demo it out here as, as such. So with that, um, we're going to give it up to Tiffany for the next level on a, let's say, pod based kind of monitoring. I'm still not used to this whole passing the mic thing. It's kind of cool. <laughs> All right, so yeah, pod base and then like specifically going into service mesh. All right, so basically um, earlier, like we saw just kind of like a high level of like all the different places that we can look at. So this specifically, again, is at the pod. So like basically um, what you have is you have like your application that is running in your pod and then you also end up having what, like you mentioned earlier with the sidecar, but having a sidecar where you can do some sort of observability over there. So using that to be able to collect metrics specifically at this level. So if we just take like a quick look over this, so this is just like having one application running and that is c this container is connected to the network traffic. So within this pod, you can have multiple uh, containers running. It doesn't make too much sense to have two different applications that are going on in there. Instead, since both of the containers or whatever containers you have inside of a pod, they're all connected to the same network traffic. So basically, this sidecar or proxy basically can go and see everything that's happening that your application can also see and collect data based on that with uh, basically get network data and listen on that. So it's not super useful if you just have it for one specific pod. It makes a lot more sense to have it for every single pod that you have running. So that way you can get all the information for the network that's happening on your, for all the apps that you have running. So basically, you have your control plane, which is going to go and collect all this information from what is running on your data plane. So you can see things like how long does a specific trip take, and just like if you only, again, have just a proxy in one, there's only so much information that you can specifically get. You can apply rules, et cetera, and just do things based on that. So one of the really nice things is it is independent of whatever language or framework you end up using. Basically, it's running separately from your application, so you could use Go, you could use Java, et cetera. You could use different frameworks inside of the same language. It doesn't matter. But based on the fact that it is running separately, you can't get app-level metrics specifically from this, but you can get all of the network metrics instead. So it kind of limits the depth of like what you can see, but the fact that it's separate makes it pretty nice. And because of that, you can also be like, okay, well, I tried this out. This isn't for me. I don't want to do this. And then you can just go and pull out those sidecars. You don't have to go and rebuild your applications. It will restart your pod, but that's not, that's not too bad compared to having to rebuild your entire application and push that back up. So then all of this goes and just like feeds into the control plane that collects all of that specific data. So this is a, a diagram specifically from Kiali using Istio. So like the fact that you have all these metrics, Sometimes, depending on who you are, you may wa not want to just look at a bunch of numbers and try figuring that out and see what's connecting. So being able to visualize that helps a lot. Like with Kiali, you can see things like percentage breakdown of a uh, split between different versions. You can see the direction that traffic is flowing. Um, and this is just like for a simple like to-do list uh, that um, Matias had created, but basically. <laughs> Um, so yeah, basically it just like helps you get a lot more visibility into what is happening, whether th something is like, if it ends up being red for instance, or if, I guess he's partially colorblind, hence the purple uh, Kubernetes logos on some of the slides, but depending, it may or may not be useful. Um, but it's a lot more useful as your application gets more complicated, uh, trying to figure out what is happening. Like for instance, we can see that on this one, something wasn't set up with Wavefront proxy and therefore uh, all the traffic is red. So just being able to look into these different types of things. So just kind of to give a little overview of this, basically it extends Kubernetes for limitations in like things like traffic awareness or shaping. Like for instance, if you have a bunch of like five replicas of your pod for a deployment, like it would be split evenly over that. But if you're like, hey, I want 30% on this and 20% on this, et cetera, you can use service mesh to help you with that. 
And then you have the concept of having like a sidecar proxy that is injected into every single pod that you have. Um, when you first start up, you may ma maybe want to manually do that, but you can set up so that every new pod ends up doing that. You can't get application level metrics. That's stuff that we'll look into a bit later. And then you can make changes during runtime instead of having to rebuild something as well. So the next part that we're going to look into is on the side of node-based instead of pod-based. Um, eBPF is one of the ways of going about doing this. It isn't the only one. So basically, instead of having your agents on every single one of your pods, you basically have an agent that is sitting on every single one of your nodes and observing from that. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Isovalent in the crowd. All right, so uh, eBPF stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter, which is probably why they shortened it to eBPF, because that's a lot of words. Um, so basically, like, it's a pretty low-level functionality. So like, go, we're actually like, going and looking into like, li Linux things and into like, the kernel space. So the kernel space is where your kernel software runs. Usually, this is a pretty protected environment so that you can't just accidentally mess things up. If you wanted to try contributing something to Linux, it might take you quite a while, maybe a few years to get something there, but that's not really gonna work at the iterations that you would want to be doing with something in the observability realm or just like changes in general. Um, so like you can kind of view it in a way, kind of like JavaScript running in a web page. You have code running, you can do things with it, but you aren't like damaging any of the underlying infrastructure. That's basically what the eBPF sandbox is in the kernel, so basically, yeah, you can run custom code, can't harm the environment with that. Um, and basically, since the kernel space can interact with like kernel events, such as like network events, and then you have the side over on the user space that you have like your SDK, your libraries and tools that you can do things with that. If you want to see a bunch more stuff and like really diving into things, um, yesterday James had a talk that is up on the stream, so look into that because we are not diving into that level. <laughs> it's really cool. Okay, so um, I mean there is like mo so most of the time basically with containers, the majority of them are using uh, Linux, and so basically. Uh, we have like various layers. We have the operating system. You have a container daemon. On top of you, basically have your containers. So like with the fact that it's like a low-level Linux technology, we can use that to our advantage, um, and basically get more information um, from like from the kernel from doing that. So this looks kind of similar to the diagram that you saw earlier, but. So we have our control plane, which is again collecting all of the data, and then after we're at the bottom part with your uh, data plane, basically you have your nodes, and then you have each of your agents and having that specifically on each of your nodes. Ideally, you have uh, more pods than nodes. If not, I'm, please tell me why. I'm a little concerned. Um, so that just <laughs> that's just one way of looking at. It. So um, this is a diagram that's specifically from Hubble UI. And this is Lucilium, so basically it's kind of similar. Um, basically, you can see this is for, uh, I think, yeah, this is also for pet clinics. So the other di second diagram that we saw earlier, you can see how the direction of th traffic and different things that are connecting. Um, what you don't specifically get from this dashboard, unless this has changed since we took this screenshot, is that you can't see things like uh, response times and throughput. But Lucilium does have all of these things so you can actually, do, for instance, go and look at this data uh, using Grafana and be able to like see those specific things that you couldn't in the other diagram. And so you can see things like how long does a call take, for instance, and then like a tracing breakdown as well. And like we've mostly been talking about like open source things, but Cilium has like open source core, and there's also like a licensed version as well. Not really sure where the separation is, but yeah. Um, so as eBPF is becoming more and more of a talked about topic, uh, there's a bunch of other things that are coming out as well. So there's things like Pixie, there's Dflow, there's CubeShark. Y you can see different like levels of like tracing or how things are connecting. If you want to look at a bunch of the other applications, uh, you can go to eBPF.io slash applications and there's just like a bunch of different things there. Um, some of them were talked about yesterday like Inspector Gadget, et cetera. I think there will be an eBPF day tomorrow. So if you want to know more about those tools uh, and get a better overview, I think this would be the, the place to go. We can only like scratch it on the surface here. I've never held a mic for someone before. 
Okay, so just to high level on this side of things, basically you are injecting your proxy component on the node level instead of on your pod level. Um, since you have fewer hops, there's less latency. Uh, it's using a low level functionality basically for, for Linux that's leveraged for specifically for Kubernetes purposes in this case. And then it's like changing pretty rapidly. There's a bunch of stuff coming out even just compared to like a year ago. There's so much more that is out there now. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Matthias. All right, thanks a lot. All right, so, so to sum things up until here, we've kind of seen um, on, an, on an entry level how with the Kubernetes API we are able to, for example, like sense if there are any kind of problems or there might be some certain problems in your, in your landscape. And with the help of, of like service mesh functionality, be it pod-based or node-based, we're now able to like see the, the traffic flow between those components. So we also can already go into an isolation level of our problems, but we still cannot see into the applications as the components are, as I said, either running on the, not, uh, on the node or on the pod, but not within the application container. And for that, uh, we basically come to the, to the final part, uh, monitoring with, within the application itself. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as it looks here on the slide, just putting that little um, like uh, agent into the app. But generally, this is how it works. So of course, then the, the, the metrics are being collected and there are various ways to, to visualize that to the observability end users. Now, the problem with that landscape is as well, there is a lot of different toolings that will plug into application and provide different like um, deep level tracing and, um, and, um, and metrics uh, collection. One of the things to highlight in this context is certainly open telemetry. I think this one is one of the, the tools in the CNCF landscape, which come, it was like I think second one after Kubernetes with the highest commits. Um, please tell me if I'm wrong, but this is what, what I just heard recently. And it's also one that, that's showing uh, a, posit a positive tendency in my opinion, while on other areas the landscape is more and more spreading out and you have like very many different solutions that you have to select from, open telemetry is actually like merging things together from, from, from different solutions. So the way it works on, on high level, uh, I should probably say it, it's not like a full observability solution with dashboard and everything. It really focusing, it's focusing on the side of standardizing the collection of the information. So in the past, many vendors had like proprietary formats of how, to, how they collect their like tracing metrics and log information and open telemetry tries to standardize that to give um, a lot of parties the chance to integrate into that system and especially with the application landscapes becoming much more polyglot, um, being able to co correlate all the, um, all, the, all the collected stuff across the different components. So we're going to look a little bit into um, what is currently out there for application collection um, and the way you, you can actually start doing that. Now, so far, everything in the talk has been totally application framework agnostic because we did not go into the application itself. Once you start monitoring from inside of the application, of course your agent has to be specific to that implementation language. So a little disclaimer, the, the, the next couple of examples are more Java based than, than, than others, but still there, are, uh, there is a lot of different agents for various um, implementation languages out there. So with this, with the Java part, um, the, the least intrusive way to actually get there is to plug the um, open telemetry agent into your Docker container, or like into your container. Um, you do that by adding it to your, to your uh, Docker file and then hook, like kind of hook it into the, to the Java command. This has the advantage that you don't have to actually rebuild your char file and you only need to rebuild your container. Anyway, either way, it's a higher level of intrusion as, as what we've seen before because it, it's not only requiring a restart but a rebuild activity. Um, after that, you of course need to configure that part in basically telling where to send the metrics to, in this case like the open telemetry collector, and from then on it can be kind of um, aggregated and correlated with other things. Of course, you can do it in a different way to really plug it into your application infrastructure, basically modifying dependencies and, and pull in the open telemetry collector there. From there, it's kind of the same procedure. You also have to basically get, take the information and send it to the collector. So you see there are various ways of collecting data um, into open telemetry and then things kind of getting um, stitched together there. Um, and then, 
uh, you of course start getting application level metrics. So again, this is a Java example, collecting metrics and visualizing them in a custom Grafana dashboard. And now you're seeing like uh, Java garbage collection, um, heap information, things like that. And this is something you would not get with any kind of uh, uh, service mesh implementation, at least not to what I'm aware of by now. Um, Jaeger is a technology I want to highlight here real quick. This, um, this has been there before OpenTelemetry, but it's certainly got a big push through OpenTelemetry because it can be used with that uh, in, in, a, in a fairly easy way. But it was always already possible to use it with other technologies, for example, with Istio, as, as uh, Tiffany said before. So here, you would see a Jaeger example, sorry, <laughs> um, how if you feed the information just from a an, from an service, service mesh Istio-based thing. So you only see the two services and basically the, the outer um, trace and the, and the inner span when one service starts, hands over to the other and returns. So this is the entire information that you get from an outside perspective. Once you go further into that, you see the traces with the application specific components. So you see like the rest endpoints when you hit the application, you see like the, um, the MVC pattern, then the, the, the database invocation, and it's very easy then to isolate or pinpoint which is your problematic component um, with, within your app. Um, this is, can be done by, by a thing called auto instrumentation or um, auto SDK in OpenTelemetry. You don't have to do anything except putting the agent in and you get the information out. However, if you have um, certain levels in your code um, that is not being auto detected by the auto instrumentation, you can still tell there are ways to, to, to talk to the, this, this SDK and say, okay, I want this method and this variable to be collected in my trace as well. In the Java world, you have the annotation, for example, with span and span attribute. Um, by default, the original version of the code would be here. So you have a post mapping, you enter a string, and it would be saved to the database. I now rerouted that to an, a method that I called some useless method because we don't really need to use it, um, which would just like be not be like collected from the auto instrumentation. So then I annotated this, and once I did that, it then shows up in the traces as well. So you might, that's, this might come in useful if you have an error which just like shows up sometimes and you don't know why it's happening and then you can basically figure out and say, okay, this is, this is the variable setting of that execution call that has caused the problem and then um, isolate it further down. Yeah, I'm, it, I'm saying make a break soon. We're going to make a break soon, um, three minutes. Um, so yeah. Sum it all, to sum it up here, this one, as I said, is, is not as simple as the previous solution because it is specific or limited to the implementations of very, various programming languages, but with that in turn, you get all the details from inside. So this is kind of the, the price you have to pay um, to get to the level of this root cause analysis. Now, yeah, to sum things up, I, I hope we were able to give you a bit of like a categorization of where the various tools are falling into what kind of level of information you can expect by paying how much of interaction with your cluster and your, and, and your, and your containers. Um, of course, um, this is the final thing I want to say. We don't know all of the solutions by heart in, in that landscape. So before I open the round for question, I also have a question for you. And that's like, from your experience, did we forget anything significant we should highlight here? Uh, is there some, I mean, we, these are the ones that we are familiar with from, from, from projects, from uh, our own experience, but of course it's hard to know them all. Um, and with that, I think this is again the link to the, the, the three hour version of this talk will do the same stuff, but have all the live demos and setup and configuration included, so you have a lot of time, uh, feel free to watch it. Um, and um, I think with that, we can say thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. I think uh, we have still like a f two or three minutes for a few last questions if you want to tell, if you want to ask. Anyone questions? Yeah, here. One of the, <coughs> one of the interesting projects I think that could be useful in auto instrumenting code without changing it would be the continuous profiling stuff. Yeah. I'm curious, like, have you looked into that stuff at all? Or? So the, is that, but basically injects the um, open telemetry code into running applications? More that it takes like a, 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 um, a core file from 
what's actually happening or, uh, constant, or continuously profiles the application using like kernel performance and kind of looks at the way that the application is operating against the, the Linux kernel and the resources that it's using. So it can actually understand like where a particular function, like where in your code a particular function is taking a long time, like what you're actually doing for those sorts of things. The companies that are in this space are things like Polar Signals and- Okay, and does it work across all kinds of languages? Uh, it does and it's actually even getting more and more interesting because like Polar Signals, for example, is now able to like do a lot more discovery yeah. of functionality, like automatically discovering particular functions in Python programs, for example, like without ha without any instrumentation in the code itself, which is wild to me. But like, okay, it's a really we'll interesting new that. space. Yeah. <laughs> Next iteration of the talk, we're going to have it. <laughs> Thanks. Well, are there any questions too? Or any questions? Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so we will.